Hi, I'm Lisa Redfern, and this is Ginger Snap, a conversation and a cookie with a creative mainer, and this is episode 98, and I'm here with Orson Horkler, and he is um, a Portland-based musician, uh, public artist, builder, contractor, carpenter, all around. You do so many things, so that's one of the reasons I'm I wanted tired. to interview you. I'm tired. <laughs> one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you and have people meet you is that to me you define part of what being a Mainer is is that we have we wear a lot of hats we do a lot mm, of jobs yeah. we we do a lot to you know to make it here in Maine and so tell everybody what you want to let them know about what you're up to right now what are your what kind of creative uh, projects all right so uh, the thing I'm putting most energy in is I have uh, my first TED talk coming up and oh, that's, that's right. uh, in less than in about ten days I guess that's so cool <laughs> so. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna have to work a lot more on it because I just uh, deleted my Word document I had oh. last night. Oh, no. But uh, but yeah, so I'm working on that and just talking about uh, try to explore like what's the opposite of being xenophobic. Uh, it's a topic I think about a lot. And so yeah. when when I was asked to do a, a TED talk, I wanted to. Th I thought, what are the things that I think about every day? Yeah. And I feel like I don't really have a venue to share them. Mm -hmm. um, because I could share them with like people who experience it, but sometimes I can't even talk to them because we don't speak the same language. Literally. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> people in my band, so my yeah. band I play yeah. with. So the the other big project, uh, well, the thing that I'm really passionate about is is music and uh, mm -hmm. um, especially the live music we're doing right now. So I'm in mm -hmm. a band that I started with uh, two people who were working for me at the company, mm -hmm. and so I figured, you know, that you're saying everybody in Maine has to do a lot of things to, yeah. to, to get by. Mm -hmm. And so it's really hard to get together with musicians because right. especially a lot of them <laughs> work in the food industry. Yeah. Uh, so they work at night when you're, and so I figured if I'm going to be in a band, I have to hire the people like in, my, in a daytime job <laughs> so we yeah. can all take yeah. off early on a Friday. Mm -hmm. or, right. Right. So I started playing with a, a Congolese drummer who was working for me. And then also Uli Burkovka, yes. the, the, the accordion Hi, player. So, <laughs> Uh, he went to uh, he went he's home in Albania, to Albania. For a month. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, but but we don't <laughs> we we speak maybe like twelve words in common. So yeah, we work together. Yeah. We play music yeah. together. Um, Pick the right twelve words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Google Translate for Albanians uh, is really not good. So, yeah. <laughs> that's great. All right. So, when did you first come to Maine? Um. Well, I first actually first came to Maine when I was a year old. You did? Yeah. Yeah. So I was born in Philly. Uh, my parents moved to Maine when I was a year old to get as far away as they could from my grandmother, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, <laughs> and then, so they came to Maine, and then mm -hmm. uh, after two, two and a half years, mm -hmm. uh, my mom decided to leave, and she took me back to France. She was born in Morocco, but she, okay. she found the family's in France, so she wanted to go back to the family. Uh, as my dad famously said, I don't know why your mom got cabin fever. I got her membership at the Y, which is like in Ellsworth, okay, Ellsworth, Oops. Maine, in yeah. 1979. So, oh so, uh, so yeah. So then I, I grew up in France, and then as soon as I could, when I turned 18, and when I finished my high school, I okay. came left France and wow. came to the U.S. So, so where does Hungary fit into this? Uh, my dad was, and that part of the family were refugees from Hungary mm. right after the war mm -hmm. so as communism was setting in yeah. uh, they left um, mm. yeah so so my dad I think he was either 12 or 14 when he came mm. to the US mm. yeah wow. did you hear a lot of stories about that uh, you, when you were well yes up? and no I mean growing up I had no idea what my ethnicity my dad was I didn't even really, really know my last name my dad's last name for until I was maybe 10 or 11 so wow. all this was kept secret from me. So I didn't really get to know my dad till till I was eighteen, and I came to to the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, come on wow. my own. <laughs> wow, this so. guy's got a lot of stories. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Oh my gosh! Wow. Well, do you know your first word? And if you don't know, what do you think it I, may have been? No, I really don't know. No, it would have been. Would it have been English or French then? Uh, I don't. Well. I was I don't know because I I was mostly speaking French because my dad would be working long hours mm. and my mom would speak mm. French. Mm. So I said at home, so I don't know. All right. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, my first word was cookie, so this is our segue. Okay. Oh, your first word really was cookie. Yeah, I found oh, wow. it in my baby That's book. Amazing. Okay, we're gonna show how big these are. <laughs> Mine is well, you got a bigger one than me. No, I did. No, it's just that it's farther. Than <laughs> <laughs> these are these 
are the chocolate chip, what they call the chocolate chip campfire cookie from uh, When Pigs Fly. In um, oh, no, I got yeah. these at the one in Freeport. Now you're so, going to watch us eat. Mm -hmm. There's extra, there's something extra in there and I don't know where it is. I should have found out. But it's like a chewy chocolate chip, but there's something mm. else in there. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Okay, so have you had a cool car in your life that if you could get it back, you would... I'm going to put that right there. Um, I think, uh, I think my... <laughs> I think my, uh, my, yeah, no, I actually, if I could, I would not have a car. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I like best living without a car when I live in New York City. Mm. They need a car. Did you have a bike in walk. New York City? Yeah, I had a bike. Mm -hmm. I had mm -hmm. a bike. I walked a lot, like yeah. hours and hours mm -hmm. a day, up to eight, 12 hours a day. I didn't care. I walked. <laughs> and then I also drove a, um, petty cabs in New York. Mm, you That's did? A job, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you got to know New York so, well, huh? <laughs> yeah. That was a really in, in, mm. intense and fun way of mm. going around New York. Yeah, so I love... That was my... One of my favorite ways. Mm -hmm. Means of locomotion. Yeah. I lived in New York <laughs> after college, and I think... The thing about walking in New York is you just... There's so many people to look at and things to look at that you walk for a couple hours, and you realize, I just walked for... Yeah, yeah. Like two hours, and yeah. didn't really think about yeah, it. Yeah, and I, I... So that's one... Uh, and so, so I went to live in New York, and then, um, well, I lived in New Orleans a little bit, New York, mm -hmm. and then uh, came back here. My dad wasn't doing well, and then, mm -hmm. and then I had a son here, so I stayed here. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> you heard the story before. Uh, so, but that was one thing that was hard for me as a creative person. I, like, I don't mm -hmm. know when you write songs, like, what inspires you. But I find, like, people who do well in Maine often, like, they say, oh, I took my banjo and go by the river. And, I, and like, that doesn't work for me. Like, like if I go to a homeless shelter, I'll get inspired. You know, if, mm -hmm. I, if I see, like, um, life stories, kind of, mm -hmm. and people and the poignancy of, like, you're walking down the street and you see somebody for a split second, mm -hmm. you know? And, mm -hmm. you, like, you see a beauty in them and you don't know yeah. if you'll ever see them again. And, and you imagine their life in your head or yeah. something. and all that stuff was very, very inspiring for mm. me. So, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. That stuff happens. That that stuff happens proportionably to our openness to it happening. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. <laughs> right. And that's too, like, I think, um, so when I think about, for example, with xenophobia, I think a lot about, like, what are places that allow us to, 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 to like, relax or not, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And what, yes. what are places that are more uncomfortable? Where you feel open. So I've, yeah, so I think that that was it, too. Like, there, mm. um, if I'm in a place where everybody else is having an experience of culture shock at all times, which you do in New York, yeah. you know, because everybody's from somewhere else. Right, right. Like, <laughs> everybody is sort of, you, you either, like, get uptight or you just let go. Right, right. Know? So being mm. in, yeah. Mm. That's so interesting. All right, so are you a reader? And if you are, do you have a couple books you'd like to recommend? Yeah. To, uh... Uh, first of all, I'm not much of a reader. Uh, I've read way enough books in my childhood that I don't need to read anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're over I'm it. Okay, this, this, is, how I, this is how I, 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 I luckily could speak English when I got here. It's like, yeah. when I was growing up, my mom had it. One week, we had to read a book in French, the next week in English. Oh, my God. Different. So, like, that, like that for 10, 12 That's years. That's fantastic. Um, mm. But also... Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I'm, I'm more of a podcast person. I just really don't, like, I almost, I probably have more, like, I have books around the house mm -hmm. because it makes me think of, all oh, that day in, like, two years or three years or five <laughs> years when I'm going to actually get to relax and read a book. It seems like such a dream. Uh, so it takes me a while because I'll be reading mostly, like, before going to sleep, and mm -hmm. I'll read one page, and I'll go to sleep. Mm -hmm. I'll read one page, so if it's 300 pages, it's 300 days. Uh, but the the last few books I read that I really liked, uh, one of them is uh, I took notes because I'm really bad. Okay, so uh, and I don't want to uh, miscredit somebody. Uh, Chinese Patriot Number One by Lauren Hilgers, and it talks about the dissidents, Chinese dissidents uh, in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese immigration to America is something I don't know well, even though mm -hmm. I spend many many hours. 
and days in Chinatown and all mm -hmm. this. And mm -hmm. I don't know much their experience, so mm -hmm. her book is like so well written. It's just mm -hmm. gripping, you know. Like just the yeah. writing. The writing is so right. good that you hear you about this about, guy. You can read about anything if the yeah. writing is good. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. describing this guy like making himself a cup of tea, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it hot yet? You know, so <laughs> uh, Madame President, uh, which is a biography of er uh, Ellen Sirleaf, mm. uh, who was the the first uh, in the twentieth century, the first uh, female African leader of Liberia. Very very interesting. Mm. Um, wow. And then oh, Republic of Pirates too by Colin Woodward, mm. and he's a Portland, Maine author, and he wrote one of the the authorities on Pirates of the Caribbean. Huh. Uh, and I, yeah, that was a really, first of all, really well written. Yeah. And he talks a lot about uh, democracy because they, how much uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean influenced the American democracy because they had, okay, really? so, I so back, thought of that. yeah, so, so uh, back in, in those days, yeah. first of all, the, the, that was before the American Revolution, before the European Revolutions. Yeah. The captain was elected, right? Mm -hmm. And you could go to get voted down. Or thrown uh, off the boat. Yeah, but they typically, they, <laughs> that's the thing, is that typically they didn't, they didn't do that. They didn't mutiny because they didn't have to. They're just like, whoa, you lost your job, buddy. And when they <laughs> got... To the galley. Right, <laughs> 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 uh, when you got your... Uh, uh, when you got to be captain, then they, were, they got the, uh, uh, you know, the treasure from a ship or captured some, some yeah. goods. Everybody got the same share, except the captain got twice the share. Huh. And now we're talking in the 20, 21st century, you're like, okay, so this CEO makes 4,135 times what the guy makes. Right, right, right. So it was incredibly huh. advanced. Uh, also, it's really interesting in terms of race. Um, there's a couple things that, that terrorized, the, especially the British, mm -hmm. uh, was that they would see on the pirate ships, because sometimes the pirate ships would, would capture... Uh, slave ships coming to the Caribbean mm -hmm. and so some of the pirates were would, would drown everybody and some others would bring them on board and make uh, make everybody the same uh, you know the, 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 they would all be pirates on the, you know, uh -huh, the uh -huh. same uh, huh. title so hmm. it actually terrorized the British to see people like black people with guns for example mm -hmm. to see a mixed crew and also to see some of their their own countrymen or Europeans that spent all day, all their whole lives in the sun, and it was kind of hard to distinguish. Like that was really confusing to yeah. them. Huh. So anyway, this this is a great book. Wow, that sounds. Um, I I don't. Have you heard of the languages, the love languages? Uh huh. Okay, yeah. so I heard about that concept. Uh, so it's pretty simple. It's a really simple concept mm -hmm. about uh, everybody has their own. Uh, uh, like how do you show appreciation? Right. You give gifts. Uh, you you tell somebody you love them or appreciate them. Uh, you spend quality time with them. Mm -hmm. And so the the first book that uh, uh, Chapman Gary Chapman mm -hmm, wrote mm -hmm. was that in personal like romantic relationships people missed each other mm -hmm. because somebody like one spouse will like always be giving gifts, but yet yeah. the other spouse never feels appreciated. Because to them it means nothing. Right, right. You're like you. We usually love someone the way we want to be loved, instead of loving someone the way they want to right. love. Right. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. thought this. I read the. Uh, I didn't even read the whole book. I read. I started reading it like 15 years ago, <laughs> yeah. and that thing idea stuck in my head, and I think mm -hmm. about it a lot, mm -hmm. a lot more actually in work situations than romantic situations. And okay. so I told that to a friend, and she and my friend Isa Isa Bolio, who's also a Portland creative, and she's like, "Well, he made a book about it." So. Huh. So that was the last thing that I've read. It's about the five uh, languages of appreciation in the workplace. Well, it makes sense that it would translate to to other things. Like if you're in a band with someone, yeah, if right. you're in a workplace with someone, if you're in a relationship with someone, everyone's got that different language. Like, you know, at work, here's, here, here's how I feel like uh, I fit in or know what to do or here's how it gets communicated to me that I'm doing a good job, you know, and you right. know, someone thought they told you that and then you're like, well, no, this yeah. is the, the way I hear that you appreciate me is this way. And they're like, oh, well, but they, but I've been doing this. Well, but I don't hear that or I don't see yeah, that. I don't, yeah. it, I, and so, so in the workplace, so it's sense. incredibly destructive. Like when you don't yes. feel appreciated, yeah. it's not just, you know, as a, like a, a business owner, I want to make sure everything runs smoothly. It's also yeah. that, I, I've done 
you know, as a creative person, I'm sure you have to where I've done so many jobs I didn't want to be doing. And, or, or and I think that to, to, to be like proud in your mm, work mm, and to mm -hmm. feel good about your work is right. like, it's like a human right to me because mm -hmm. you spend yeah. your, you know, this is how you measure the value of somebody. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think a lot with, yeah. with Uli. Okay. So when yeah. Uli plays with me, um, <laughs> when he works with me, like, like he has a lifetime of experience yeah. and he comes here and he has to start from scratch. Right, that's kind of like right, the, right. the thing you lose when you right. when you migrate. Yeah. Um, and so, so I always think about our, with our music too. It's like a balance where uh, at work he has to listen to me, who's like thirty years younger than him, bossing him <laughs> around, and he, he's probably better than me. He is better than me in a lot of carpentry mm. because it's just how the company has to run. Yeah. But to find places like it can be the music where, where at times like he's right. the boss, like he's authority. Right. Uh, and he's recognized for that. Like it's it's so important. Yeah. So yeah, that's great, huh? Wow. All right. Speaking of music, um, <laughs> is there are there some albums or some CDs <laughs> that you come back to again and again as touchstones in your life, as as really have, having been really important to you? Yeah. Um, Orchestra Baobab. Do you know them? Mm -mm. They're a Senegalese group from mm -hmm. uh, the 70s, and um, they started recording again in like maybe 2005 or so. Mm -hmm. And so I just, it's just amazingly mm -hmm. beautiful music. So I listen to Orchestra Baba a lot, and it always comes back. I mm -hmm. can't escape it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say, like, you, nobody's going to know that, but like the French rapper who I really, um, uh, Joe Star, who was, was from the the, one of the pioneer rap bands of France called hmm. NTM. Um, I and and then also Motorhead. I listen uh -huh. like, uh, so <laughs> Motorhead and that French rapper. I listen to them because they just there's just a brutal honesty about the, mm. their art, mm -hmm. um, what they put in the songs, and also interviews. Like that's mm. really important to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you know, it's like the hidden thing where when I'm when I'm into an artist, they have to be good at interviews. Or else I, I lose my interest in them. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. And so, <laughs> no, it's weird. Like, they have to be good on Charlie Rose. Or, or on, <laughs> on Ginger Snap. Uh, or on Ginger yeah, Snap. If they're not good on Ginger Snap, I just like, get rid of them. They get off my playlist right now. <laughs> no, uh, so, um, and I, well, I think, like, uh, I think honesty to me is really a turn on in music mm. or in art, in any art, because mm. I think, like, Art is so close to entertainment. It's all, it looks the same a lot of times, mm. but yet it's the opposite because entertainment is escape, and mm. art to me is like it's the contrary. It's like you're facing the reality mm. and it's interpreting reality and all that. So, mm. um, so I feel like these are artists when I listen to them. Leonard Cohen too is sort of similar to me. Where when I listen to these artists, it's like I you can't just run away from your problems. Like mm. they're talking to you about like mm. what it means to be alive and. Mm -hmm. you know and, and death and, and romance and everything like you can't there are things that you mm -hmm. can't escape mm -hmm. so huh um. wow well thank you for those <laughs> <laughs> all right orson if a movie was made about your life what genre would it be and who do you think they'd cast as you and who would you like for them to have cast as you i, I cut your head off again <laughs> sorry um <laughs> well i i'm sorry but i don't really want a movie I want That's a, okay. I want a reality TV show. <laughs> Nobody has said that yet. That's so funny. So Orson so, would like a reality TV show. Right. Um, okay. It's interesting because when I, I was thinking about that question, I was thinking, oh, all right, so I think about like a, a, an adventure movie. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, well, I want my life to be like this and it's not like this, you know? Mm. Or so... But reality TV show, actually, I think about that a lot because you have no idea. Like, if you've, we could take Ginger Snap. Do you have cameras installed in each of your rooms? Yeah. Way? Well, that's what you signed the document when you walked in, right? Remember? Yes, I okay. did. <laughs> so, no. Uh, uh, all right. I have a non disclosure. It, it kind of goes back to, like, I, I came to Maine and I was really comfortable in New York and I and I do think I did a pretty good job of making my life exciting in a place mm -hmm. that where. 
it's kind of a little bit harder to exciting? find adventure, right? More exciting so, than you thought, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> I, I like, but my every day, like, if, if Ginger Snap could follow us for, for a day, trust me, like, it's like drama, there's like laughing, there's a... Uh, uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, like, the reality, especially with a lot of times when I'm working or, or making music with people from such radically different cultures... Yeah. Is it is this incredible like I mean that's what that's what I live for. That's yeah. what I got like the yeah. main the that's really the thing I got up. going on yeah. in my life. Like like I love my crews, my, my music crew, my work crew. Mm. Um and yeah, and I and I and I honestly wish like more people would see it because because it's so much more entertaining than the reality you shows know, I see. That, well, TV, so. it's not a bad idea. Maybe there's someone out there watching this who's like. I've, well, I've talked about it a couple of people, yeah. but it's yeah, but it's you know, I was like, how do you find the time? Like, I'm it's actually decide. a little more work than you know. You know. Oh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. All right, hey, before I forget, I want to let everybody know I am wearing the Mainer. Oh, it's, I know it shows up backwards. Uh, T-shirt that. Can you tell them about the this? Rainum. The, the, the <laughs> Can you tell them about this project and about? There you go. No, you have the only Ziva, one. Right? I only made it for you. You have only one. No. Um, yeah, yeah. Isn't it? Is, yeah. Hi, Viva. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about that. How, how did that project start? That's such a cool project. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I started doing street art about You're six, falling off. six, seven years ago. Come back. There you go. <laughs> um, about six, seven years ago, I was in Bangor. Um, I was walking home one day and... and um, one thing that that's hard, it's a little bit hard in in uh, in Maine. I think also a lot of the rural U.S. Yeah, when you come from other cultures, and most cultures are street cultures. Like after work, you go out, you go discuss politics, you go flirt, you go do whatever you do, you the go markets, play soccer outside, eat, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, mm -hmm. and so, when you're not in, from the place, it means that when you come here, you can be really, really lonely because you mm -hmm. come here and there's no like. So that's I was so walking back. It was a beautiful night in Bangor, Maine. And uh, I was walking home, and there was nobody on the street. And everywhere I walked by the houses, there was like these blue, blue lights of television. Oh, and man. I and I was, mm. you know, I was like um, so upset about it. I guess that I just stopped in my tracks. I'm, right, I'm not putting one more foot forward until I decide I come up with a plan, to do something about it. Hmm. So I thought about <laughs> doing street art because yeah. I can draw and stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> and I can goof off, and that's, that's the two things. <laughs> that's the combo. Yeah. <laughs> Make a good image, goof off. <laughs> So, so I uh, so I started doing street art, and then it's funny because I was doing it for kicks at first, for for fun, and then mm -hmm. people really related to it, and I really mm -hmm. started thinking a lot about belonging with mm -hmm. street art, and like mm -hmm. okay, like like this is my way to assert my belonging. Yeah. And then when I moved to Portland, I didn't really have much to say about Portland, so I moved here like four years ago. Mm -hmm. And then, but I was thinking a lot about the politics, the stuff going on, and yeah. uh, I finally, after years of living in Maine, I finally had a community. And most mm. of the most of my community was Congolese and mm -hmm. people from Rwanda. I, was, I met here because mm -hmm. we're all francophones, right? And right, I felt right. like, and then I felt like, well, the governor is, you know, talking them down and saying they yeah. don't have the same rights I would to get right, general right. assistance and all that. So it made me really mad, and uh, I just started doing this, um, these portraits, and then going out and putting them up on, mm. in public, and then. Uh, one thing in, uh, in a small state like in like Maine too that's great is like mm. when you're doing something interesting, yeah, the press wants you mm. because you're giving them stories and sometimes mm. they have a hard time finding them. Mm. So the, my like illegal installations got good coverage. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I got invited to do all these the installation. Uh, the attorney general, yeah, it was pretty awesome. I was like, I was going into schools talking about uh, immigration in mm. Maine yeah. and then getting checks signed Paul the page. It was pretty awesome. So, oh, it's so wild. So what because it was the because the yeah the secretary <laughs> no the the attorney general in the state mm -hmm, mm -hmm. enforces uh, the Civil Rights Act. Yes, that's their role. But they also have to spend a certain amount of money educating about right, issues around right, that. So right. they, I work with the, uh, uh, the Maine Historical Society. Um, I work with the Maine, Maine Humanities Council. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much all non-art organizations, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of public schools that invited me to come over, and then, so it started. It became more, much more like a conversation about, right. like I remember, because people also when I'd be putting this stuff up, sometimes they're like, oh, thank Stop you for up. doing this, yeah, and, yeah. and I'd be surprised because it'd be like this, 
like you know i don't know this older white woman stepping out of a lexus saying thank you and telling me a story of like how her son grew up here mm. and he was born here but because he not like yeah. from from here yeah like he he, got, he wants to move away because he mm. you know or mm. and then also i'd be there and people would like start you know like insulting me or something when i put up this stuff mm. so my goal was like okay i, I don't want to finish like I don't want to stop doing this artwork. So yeah. this guy's behind me. Starts I'm going to have to talk. So right. I said, okay, I'm, not, I'm going to try to not get mad. I'm going to, like, okay, ask questions. So yeah. it really was an exercise and trying to keep the conversation going as much as possible with people yeah. who were really important sometimes really like yeah. verbally violently opposed to what I was doing. Yeah. So we also had like city uh, hall meetings mm -hmm. sort of, mm -hmm. like in Farmington yeah. with the University of Maine facilitating it where we would talk about... Uh, like everybody would come mm -hmm. and people would mm -hmm. tell me stories about why they felt like they're they yeah. why why they had a hard time seeing people from away in their state i learned a lot mm -hmm. about that yeah and it helped me so many heal people. a lot yeah. of that too because uh yeah things were, were rough like uh after 9 11 especially like living in northern maine like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean i was assaulted on a job site once somebody thought mm -hmm. i was a terrorist and so mm -hmm. So, th so there's a, and, and then also years of just not really fitting, so yeah. fitting in. So yeah. that was, it was, a, it was a thing to do, um, and a process, mm -hmm. the process turned out to be really, yeah. really, uh, uh, yeah. It's important. Really good. But yeah. Can you tell people time. where to get this t-shirt if they would like yeah, to get on one? Yeah, on pigeonnation.com. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Pigeonation and how to, how to reach you, how should people reach you if they want to know about your music? Number one, how should also they reach you if they want to hire you as a builder? Yeah, yeah. So, um, good question. How did they reach me? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, for me, the uh, social media is always the, the best. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, Facebook is great. And okay. My name is, I'm sure, under this thing, so you can easily yep. find me. And yep. then, uh, Bon Deco, I have, uh, uh, you know, bondeco.com is right. my, my uh, carpentry. Okay. And then, uh, for, so so our band is the same name our, as our carpentry. Bon Deco? Yeah, okay. and it's great. You know why? Because when we go to a show and people, you know, like don't think of us as a carpentry yeah. business, we, they say, oh, Bon Deco's coming. And then we roll in with the company truck. And they go, wow, these guys are like... <laughs> they like, build they're, they're, and they play music. Or they don't know we build. They just think we have, we're a fancy band with names on, on the That know, is hilarious. Our band on truck. That is so, so yeah, bondecotheband.com is our... All right. So. That's great. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Orson. Right, thank thank you. you very much. You've been ginger snapped. And uh, <laughs> so I'll be back in a couple weeks uh, uh, with the penultimate episode, episode 99. Oh, oh my goodness. So, um, and I'm Lisa Redfern. And if you need to know or want to know about me or my music or what I'm up to, just go to lisaredfern.com. And uh, all right, thanks so much. Here we go. This has been Ginger Snap.